Hello everyone, uh, this is Rama Patnaik. Uh, I am a practicing librarian in the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. Welcome to this session on selection and acquisition of library materials, which is sponsored by InFlibNet. In this lesson, we are going to focus on the methods, procedures, and the issues that we need to tackle when we acquire library resources. Selection and acquisition is uh, no longer a single domain of librarianship. It is a craft that involves um, expertise from multiple domains, be it legal, technological, uh, be it legal and technological. Uh, also the subject expertise that is required to understand the, cho the choice that we make while selecting the library items. Before we delve into the changes that have transformed the selection and acquisition process in the last two uh, decades, which is basically triggered by, uh, triggered by the technological advances, especially in communication and uh, uh, information technology, the advent of World Wide Web and the amount of content that is available to the users uh, has made a lot of difference in the choices that we make while selecting and acquiring documents for our clientele. The philosophical foundations that were exposed in the last century while acquiring the library materials were propounded by either Dury's principles or Ranganathan's second law or third law of library science. Users seems to be the centric for all activities that begin and end with only the users when we start with the process of choice, process of selecting documents for libraries. Gone are the days where librarians were like sages sitting behind the desk expecting the users to approach them for whatever is their information requirements. Now with click of mouse or on the smartphone or on internet, user seems to be empowered to access any information that he or she wants and the expectations from the library resources and services is surmounting day by day. So they want the librarians to be available to them, be it in classroom, be it in dormitories, hostels, travel lounges, cafes, everywhere. So the technological uh, and the, actually the techno technology has empowered to transcend these time and geographical barriers uh, Gone are the days where librarians were like sages sitting behind the desks and expecting the users to walk up to them for any of their information requirements. Uh, with the advances in technology, the barriers of time and geography has been transcended and the users' expectations from the library has increased the, so much that they expect us to be omnipresent everywhere, be it in the classroom, the dormitory, the hostels, the lounges, the travel lounges, the cafes, wherever they are, they want to access from everywhere where they can do because the amount of information that is available otherwise either from the web or from Google seems to have a, created that kind of level of expectations from the librarians. So before we delve into the changes, we also have to look into what has triggered or what has transformed the selection and acquisition process over the last two decades. Technology has changed the way we actually organize our materials, the choices that we make. There, there is also changes in the pedagogy, the way the uh, content is actually delivered to the users, the in information seeking behavior. I think everything has changed so much that we have to reinvent ourselves, trying to understand uh, how we can be innovative and also be uh, using all the choices that are available to have the resources which are needed by our uh, library. This lesson will basically focus on electronic resources, be it electronic databases, journals or ebooks because as we know whether it is in India or globally, 80% or more than 80% of our budget goes on electronic subscriptions. So in this lesson, I'm going to focus basically on the 
issues or the methods, the tools that are involved in acquiring or making selection choices for audiovisual resources, electronic databases, electronic journals and ebooks. We will also touch upon the traditional methods that we have been using for so many years during the print world. We will briefly discuss about them uh, as we are already familiar with the tools or the techniques that we have usually adopted while dealing with the print domain. Let us look at the changes that have transformed the selection and acquisition of library collection over the last two decades. The most important and prominent change is the ubiquity of internet and uh, advances in information and communication technology. That has not only influenced the landscape of publishing industry, scholarly communication, pedagogical changes, content preferences, prefer uh, preservation strategies, evaluation techniques, a lot, uh, and a lot of issues triggered by these changes. As libraries are drifting to electronic formats, uh, formats selection and evaluation process would continue to evolve ever changing with the ever changing uh, publishing formats. Though the role of subject expert is still relevant in accessing the content, new domain of expertise especially in technology and legal field will continue to expand the intrusion of multiple stakeholders in the selection process. As selection committees in academic and research libraries have already started interfacing with the technology and legal departments within their organization, uh, selection as a craft is not confined to the domain of librarianship at all. It now involves expertise as discussed on the legal and technological issues as well. We have also seen how the emergence of consortium among various types of libraries, whether in India or abroad, the individual decisions have uh, individual decisions and expertise continue to be diluted with collective decisions. The economic challenges, the budgetary restraints, and the technological issues are increasingly replaced by collective decisions by the new breed of library professionals who have a shared vision in reducing the cost of such acquisitions. Let us look at some of the traditional methods which are still applicable even to the electronic content. These may include the content and subject which were evaluated in terms of their scholarly nature, the scope of the topic, whether, it, whether the subject covered is either at periphery or in in-depth level which is usually done by the subject experts or the subject librarians. Secondly, the currency. The date stamps on the content that is created is to be checked how current is the information that is covered in the content. Apart from these two, we also have to look into the author's reputation, credentials, which are verified by his affiliation with the parent institute and also the reputation of publisher. Apart from the above, the writing style, the geographic coverage, the physical quality, uniqueness of content, reader level are also taken into consideration while assessing these issues when it comes to the content. Traditionally, this method is widely being used by the subject librarians or the subject experts whenever an item in whichever format is selected for library. The other method which is very specific to the print domain is the conspectus method which was developed in 1979 by the research and library groups in North America which has proposed a collection level to access uh, uh, or define the extent of library collection. These levels could be like out of scope where the library does not need the collection in this area at all, the minimum level where a few selections can be made beyond very basic works. The basic information level where up-to-date general materials that serve to introduce and define a subject to indicate the variety of information available elsewhere 
Typically, these would include the encyclopedias, the historical surveys, bibliographics, handbooks, and Q major periodicals. Then the instructional support level where in a university which is adequate to support undergraduate and most gradu postgraduate instruction or sustained independent study that is required to maintain the knowledge of a subject required for limited or generalized purposes or less than research in intensity. The other level which is actually influence the selection choices and more significantly are the research and comprehensive level. A collection that includes major published sources required for dissertations and independent research, research reporting, new findings, which is intended to include all important reference works on a wide specialized subject area, which may also include major indexing and abstracting services in the field. At the comprehensive level, we look into the collections which is reasonably possible to include all significant works of recorded knowledge in a particular defined field. See, the conspectus method is not completely abandoned by the research library group, but it still continues to be a standard where the library collection is evaluated in terms of its depth and relevance for the curriculum and research, uh, research activities of the parental institute. The other traditional method which is still relevant though technology is used to collect that information is circulation statistics. Libraries which were distraught with the budget restraints had to rely heavily on the sources of demand to justify funding decisions on collection development. The results of circulation analysis were applied to a number of important issues including the collection acquisition policies, guiding management decisions in allocating physical space for materials and identifying materials for off-site storage, allocating funding for materials. This also includes acquiring of multiple copies where such items are in demand. The circulation statistics are also used for deselecting approaches, the gifting policies and also the activities that are involved in collection of usage data in terms of the relevance of collection used by the user community. The third method which is still in vogue in many libraries is the collection mapping. This is a technique which actually examines the state of information resources both qualitatively and quantitatively in certain subject areas uh, and the strengths and weakness of the fixed collection with a view to further develop the same. The other method which has actually transformed with the advent of technology is the checklist method. This was first started by Smithsonian Institute in US where the checklist method acts as a collection development tool, not just an evaluation tool by illustrating the holes in the collection. This method is, is in practice for checking the library collection against a list of notable books or materials to see whether the collection include these titles or not. This was the oldest method of collection evaluation and it was first recorded use occurred in 1849 by Charles Jewett at Smithsonian Institute in US. The most widely popular, wide and popularly used evaluation method are the bibliometric studies, in other words known as citation analysis. This bibliometric te technique is used in which most of the citations in publications are examined to de determine the patterns of scholarly communication. For example, the comparative importance of books versus journals or of current versus retrospective sources or in one or more academic disciplines. The citations used by students, faculty, research scholars in their thesis and re other research artifacts and dissertations are also examined for the purpose of collection evaluation and development. Though citation, uh, citation analysis uh, is slightly replaced with emerging methods such as alt matrix and alt matrix and uh, propagated by uh, plum analytics also the, which will be discussed which we will be discussing later for its application in the electronic resources. 
The citation analysis is a method that is used at mostly at universities and research levels which looks at the citations on bibliographies prepared by the students and faculty written work to see if the resources are included in the learning institute's partner library. The purpose is to see if the written work produced can be done using the library located at the college or university. It is a very good research method to be used in academic libraries while performing co collection evaluation. This method is still widely used in libraries abroad to not only aid the collection development tools, but also identify the journals with highest impact factors while making the choice of journal subscriptions. The last method that we are going to discuss is about the user studies and usage data. Libraries have always collected empirical data among the users to obtain a subjective evaluation probing the adequacies or inadequacies pertaining to its collection. Including the users in the decision making process to evaluate relevancy, currency, preferable format, non-use of certain collection enables the library to understand the changes that are in the pattern of use, perceptions and accessibility levels to a new collection development strategies. Uh, we have already discussed about the traditional methods of evaluation for selection of library items. But uh, while selecting the electronic resources, we may have to look for additional considerations. Uh, if you look at the options that are available, these can be categorized into the three issues that is of legal, technology and preservation strategies. The first and most important of aspect in evaluating electronic resources is that of licensing and contractual terms. This is this requires some kind of legal expertise in going through the pages of the agreement that we are going to sign with the content providers when the content is either leased or purchased on ownership basis. Typically libraries would try to ignore this aspect of uh, licensing and most uh, it is generally misunderstood being very unilateral by the vendor where libraries have very little role to play. When uh, libraries started acquiring electronic content late in, uh, early in 1990s, the first thing that they were very insecure about is the perpetuity of the content that was purchased. Those days, the license, uh, first times when the li li written licensing agreement surfaced, librarians were forced to sign the agreement and mostly they were unilateral with lot of restrictions as compared to the kind of uh, rights we enjoy with the print resources. So during the trial period, we have an option of trying to understand not only about the content, but also the accessibility, the interface, the compatibility with the IT infrastructure that the institute has, the preservation strategies either which could be developed with local infrastructure or with the third party providers and the effective use of technology that is being used that is to be used for accessing the content. While evaluating electronic databases, some of the important things that have to be remembered during the trial is about the content. If you take an example of indiastart.com, which is actually modularly structured and the content that is accessible depends upon the need of the university. For instance, if you want to get only about information at a country level or state level, you can take the broad module that is available for most of the libraries. But if you are looking at in-depth information up to district or uh, taluk level, then the content will be um, available in more depth and you have may have to pay additional price for that. So for every database vendor actually repackages the content as per the need of the library and tries to price it accordingly. Uh, apart from the modularity, you will also find that the same content will be available from multiple content providers and it, there may be also a possibility where you, the content that you are looking for might be covered in multiple databases where there, uh, there are chances of duplicity of the content. There are also tools available where you can have an overlap analysis trying to identify what is the content that is unique and the percentage of uniqueness 
in a particular resource. For instance, if you are looking at evaluating business source complete or ABI informs, ProQuest ABI inform, both of them have the content quite similar, but there could be some unique titles which are which could be very unique to the individual content provider. For instance, EBSCO gives you access for Harvard Business Review, ProQuest gives access for Sloan Management Review, but about 70% of the content is common to both the databases. In such instances, the library has to choose which of the, which of the unique content is relevant for its curriculum and uh, need, uh, research needs of the community. Secondly, the technological issues. Usually the electronic resources are priced as per the accessibility that is purchased. Whether the library is going for I an IP range access, wants a remote access or looking at uh, restricted u concurrent user access. See the, uh, depending upon the need of the community, the library may choose any of these options where the accessibility of the content will be available based on the model that is chosen. Some of the times the, a particular resource may not be available on an IP range. You have to have a specific infrastructure which will, which will host the content and may not be available on internet. So these are some of the technical issues that have to be evaluated apart from the content where the library have to make choices with regard to access, the browsers, the remote access facility, downtime time and host of other software and hardware requirements. The other issue which the, which the libraries often encounter is about the perpetuity of the content. For whatever price we pay for the content for a current year, we expect that when we discontinue the subscription, that content for the paid period should be available to us. The other reason we also would like to look at is the availability of the content in mirror sites. Um, as in case of disasters, library should not be deprived of access to the content. For, the, for databases, we usually look at whether the mirror sites are geographically scattered across the continents, where if one site is down, then we get the access of access to the content from other sites automatically. The fourth and the most important issue already being discussed is about the licensing. When we are looking at negotiating the terms and conditions of usage, five to six issues that have to be looked in depth while subscribing any electronic content. The first one is about the rights of the user. Usually the content providers will restrict unlike the print world about using the content up to a reasonable amount where libraries are expected to educate the users that downloading content unreasonably might invite infringement of the agreement that we sign with the vendors. If, if as an institute you are extending the access not only to your user community but also the external users who walk through your library to access the content, you have to have this feature negotiated with the provider about giving the access to, to walk-in users who are basically the research scholars where most of the libraries allow the access for such kind of users. The other part is on the restrictions. Most of the databases will have inherent DRMs and also restrict on the usage. It is not like the way we use the print book but there could be some restrictions whether a particular content is negotiated to be used for the course packs, electronic reserves, course reserves and scholarly communication. Most of the time the vendors would not restrict but it is better that we negotiate to them, negotiate with them on the kind of usages that we foresee while using the content whether it is for the classroom teaching, whether it is for the learners or whether it is for the research work. We have also observed that the governing laws that are applicable for most of the license agreements are that of either the United States of America, Singapore or UK. In such cases, we see that the copyright law of India, Government of India of 1953 will not be applicable and we are also, we have to insist with the vendors that the local laws should be applicable while executing this contract for rights and uh, terms and conditions for using the content. There are also some obligations set out by the content provider 
as to as to applicable as to usage of the content where libraries are expected to educate the users what what actually amounts to infringement of the terms and conditions within the contract that was signed with the content provider likewise the licensee also would not share any of the details while tracking the usage and also the user user information the, uh, there are actually privacy laws that are applicable where the content provider is not expected not to compromise with the information that is collected on the usage so the licensing you can uh, you can know more about the licensing issues uh, in a paper published by me in economic and political weekly issue 22nd december 2014 where we ha where i have shared the complexities that are involved in negotiating licensing uh, license issues and contracts that were signed with the content providers now let us look at uh, how we should be evaluating the electronic journals and serial subscriptions sub serial subscri subscriptions the traditional evaluation parameters that are applicable to electronic journals include its education and research value whether a particular journal is indexed in indexing services such as web of science or scopus the impact factor based on the citation studies whether it is by scopus or web of science or there are host of other general ranking uh, organizations it also depends upon the reputation of the publisher and the way the institute will try to identify based on their citation and uh, bibliometric studies uh, on the tiered journals based on its research focus themes however evaluation criteria which influences the collection development decisions for electronic journals which are emerging apart from this traditional methods are quite same as that of databases is the advent of big deals and subject bundles journals of a journals on a particular topic are often bundled as subject collections by publishers and offered to libraries to subscribe as a collection as a whole collection instead of individual titles here the libraries will not have a choice of selecting the titles that are relevant to them but as the publisher insist on taking a specific number of journals by bundling the non relevant titles to a specific library which sometimes is advantageous in terms of the extens extensity of the collection but also the flip side of the big deals is that they may uh, comprise the titles which are peripherally relevant and not selected by individual uh, individual libraries which also form a part of collection so the advent of big deals have actually uh, enabled the libraries with the extensity of the collection but qualitatively might not be relevant to their curriculum or research needs the other aspect which need to be looked at is the technological uh, issue where it is expected that library should be allowed to browse search print download articles from the access provided either with ip filtering or user authentication and most importantly their ability to integrate with the electronic resource management tools such as discovery services federated search services link resolvers compliance to international standard protocols journal finder and counter compliant uh, statistics apart from uh, this one of the important decision that should include is the negotiation of subscription in the availability of perpetuity for the subscribed period if a library decides to discontinue a particular title after a uh, certain period of subscription the content provider is expected to ensure that access is retained even if subscription is dis discontinued for the subscribed period we have also seen archival projects such as jstor project news and hathi trust initiatives which have helped libraries to purchase back volume from sources other than publishers however software projects like clocks and portico offer to archive digital content locally at individual libraries or mirror sites to ensure continued access while selecting the journal packages or individual titles it is imperative that the libraries must ensure the perpetuity of access through any of these third party 
content uh, third party mirror uh, providers the licensing issues that confront the databases are applicable to journals as well most of the times libraries would try to negotiate for authorized uh, access to authorized users remote access access models and most importantly the fair use doctrine or fair dealing under the international copyright agreements for journals also the counter compliant statistics are extensible a library can keep track of the usage even during the trial about the number of login sessions successful text downloads turnaways pdf downloads etc which may help to make decision on its retention or discontinuation the pricing models that are usually available for journal subscriptions are either subscription based with perpetual access or pay per view most of the time the libraries which identify its core journals will select the subscription and ownership model instead of pay per view pay per view is preferred only for Uh, as an alternative to interli interlibrary loan or document delivery services as instant access sometimes is impossible with these two options an electronic book or ebook is a digital version of the traditional book which can be read in multiple devices be it computer ebook reader smartphone or tablets ebooks are available both as aggregators packages or can be directly obtained from publishers such as net library i library overdrive world e, e library or publisher packages such as oxford taylor and francis cambridge elsevier where it is available as subject bundle and also the with an option of pick and choose majorly on ownership models over the last few years there has been tremendous growth in the sale of ebooks and especially very popular with the younger generation where libraries are increasingly investing on acquisition of ebooks and rather converting the print collection to make space for uh, space for learning and reading and and converting them into the ebook format if you look at the advantages that ebooks offer over print there can be a number of features such as searchability readers can search and find the exact word or subject within seconds of executing a search and ebook is can be modified or updated more frequently and seamlessly as compared to the print one of the striking features which for which it is popular is about its portability and one can actually carry a thousands of books in a small ebook reader and many ebook reader devices and handles to choose from and readers can increase or decrease the front size of the text image and figures and for libraries actually it is very effective in saving the space and the investment that is made into its maintenance such as shelving or preservation or the space usage they also overcome the limits of time and place library may, need not be open 24/7 but availability of ebooks is always there for users 24/7 however if you look at the disadvantages of having ebooks in library it's sometimes it is not always preferable to read large amount of text especially these scholarly books and most of the times if the battery power doesn't last for 3 hours or so users are also distraught for lack of continuity in reading there are a lo lot of readers that are uh, available and each uh, from each we have to choose with its in own format so the user preference for with the user preference for print or e depends upon the kind of book that is being preferred if it is for light reading or for fiction usually they prefer the ebook but when it is a scholarly book with more number of pages sometimes the user would prefer so there is always a flip side to the user preferences is very difficult to ascertain the kind of format that is preferred with the content that is loaded into it selection of ebooks also entails participation from multiple stakeholders the content evaluation is usually done by subject experts library licensing and financial aspects are done by library professionals and while selecting the books most of the time we depend on the expertise of 
subject experts, but a new model that is emerging to influence the selector role is known as pattern driven acquisitions or demand driven acquisitions. During the trial of ebook, the library will have an opportunity to evaluate the ease of search, the print and download options, the level of DRMs, the format, the software or the apps that are required to view or browse it and access on smart devices such as tablets and phones. It is also important to know the file formats and devices required to check the compatibility before a purchase decision is made. Usually the ebooks come in three formats. One is a PDF format which is most popularly and widely used which is stored in images and file can be viewed in ebook small screens. They are also portable to all type of devices and usually sold by publishers as bundles. EPUB is the industry standard of International Digital Publishing Forum. It is compatible with NOOC, Sony, Reader's and can be read in any Windows or Microsoft computers to adopt digital editions. There is also the first, I think the Kindle editions are the most popular about among all the formats as it can be read even with Kindle apps from any uh, device whether it is smartphone, computer or tablet. But Kindle editions cannot be read without the Kindle apps as it uses Mo Mobi Pocket format and allows the files to be locked into the user registered devices. Before downloading Kindle editions, all the devices to which it has to be downloaded is registered with the Kindle uh, with Amazon.com. A single title can be downloaded to six devices at any given point of time. If library requires more user access, it has to purchase those many accesses that can be lendable to multiple Kindle e-readers. E let us look at some of the pricing models that are available for ebooks as co uh, as compared to databases and e-journals short term rentals and res uh, short term rentals is a unique feature that is available for ebooks this feature is also available for e-journals but many libraries are using the short term rentals especially for short intervals which will not be avail which will not be available after the rental period is over Sometimes when library is interested to buy multiple copies but not interest to own all the accesses, it can consider taking the short term rental for subscribing to the ebooks at a rented price. Ebooks are also available on per perpetual access and ownership model. In this model, library pays one time amount who owns the title. However, there could be a small fee charged as a platform fee for the subsequent years. So, aggregators always sell the ebooks on subscription base. Once the subscription is terminated, access to ebooks is also terminated, and library loses the content at the expiration of the subscription. The restricted concurrent user access is also available for ebooks where a particular title is restricted to a certain number of users where the library decides to pay for, which could be either subscription or ownership model which could be based on either subscription or ownership model. Adobe Digital Editions purchased through aggregators like ProQuest and EBSCO uh, usually come with the pricing of one user, two user, three users and multiple users. It depends upon the library which chooses to own the title based on the user preferences. Apart from the traditional methods of evaluating the scope and depth of collection, authenticity and relevance, Audiovisual resources pose a different challenge for libraries, especially in terms of the file formats, software and hardware requirements, dissemination and del delivery methods. They always come with stringent copyright guidelines on access, usage and storage. Pricing models also vary from offering a product in physical form or DVD storage, streaming rentals, access base such as classroom or public mean lending to patrons or mirroring in a server. Usually the copyright laws which restrict the audiovisual resources is replication of the content for storage or, or the browse through or wrap up license agreements that come along with the physical unit. Nowadays many of the audio, audiovisual resources are available for 
downloading where the libraries can actually store in the server but the pricing models may vary for physical unit in, fo in form of a DVD or VCD uh, rather than downloading the full uh, resource in, in a format w which is prescribed by the publisher. The copyright law of US is usually applicable for these resources in academic libraries where the production of audiovisual resources resources in India is not as much as compared to what is published abroad. The US copyright law, the section 110 actually prohibits the display of audiovisual resource in a classroom until the instruct instructor is present in there. So while purchasing the audiovisual resource, library has to be very careful in understanding the terms of its usage where personal lending to the users in their own devices could be permissible but when it comes to exhibiting in auditorium or in the classroom, there could be certain restrictions. As we conclude, we have seen that selection and evaluation of library resources have gone wide, widespread transformation in the last two decades with the advent of publishing and web technologies. Libraries are slowly drifting more towards electronic formats and then the selection and acquisition process will continue to evolve with ever increasing or ever changing publishing formats. Though the role of subject experts is still relevant for selection of library materials, new domains of expertise, especially in terms of technology and legal field will continue to influence the selection choices uh, uh, and involvement of multiple stakeholders within the organization. Libraries have already started interfacing with the computer science department and the legal department within the organization. The computer science department helps in identifying the infrastructure especially for software and hardware requirements and the infrastructure that is necessary for enabling access of the content to the user community. The legal department aids in negotiating the licensing terms and the contractual agreements governing the usage, the rights of use and the obligations of the institution while purchasing an electronic product. So selection committees in selection committees in academic and uh, research libraries have already started that interface where the liaison and the promotion, the liaisoning, the promotion and outreach department also aids in engaging with the communities on the level of satisfaction that is measured among the user community. I hope in this lesson you have understood the issues that are involved while selecting library materials whether it is in whichever format, whether it is electronic resources, databases, e-journals, e-books or audiovisual resources. As technologies have already started influencing the decisions, we have to keep abreast of all the tools and techniques that are available to us while making the selection choices. It is, it is also important that all libraries have their written collection policies evolved which will serve as an authoritative framework and guidelines for, for guidelines for the staff to follow the pr procedures and methods for selection of selection and acquisition of library materials.